Hello, this is Dr. Clark and today we're going to be going over vaccines. So when we start looking at vaccines, we're going to actually be looking at why we're using them for protection and, and immunity. And the first part is to kind of understand what immunity is and there's two different forms. There's nonspecific immunity and specific. And so nonspecific are things like your skin, your mucous membranes, barriers, uh, connective tissue, uh, things like eosinophils, basophils, neutrophils, your segmented uh, white blood cells that are granulated. And these don't really look for anything specific to fight against. They're actually uh, looking for any type of foreign antigen and they're going to attack them evenly. There's also inflammation and inflammatory mediators that do this job. There's fever. So these are all things that are nonspecific. They're looking for anything in general, any antigen that comes in. This is going to be the standard reaction trying to fight them off. Specific immunity occurs whenever you have an actual antibody or you have a B cell that's producing an antibody against a specific antigen. Or you have a T cell that actually is going to go attack or put cytokines on a specific antigen. So this is actually specific to whatever the foreign invader is, be it a virus, bacteria, allergen. There's going to be a part of the immune system that is already set up with antibodies and cells specifically to attack and take care of whatever that antigen is. And so this becomes very important when we look at protection against disease is vaccination. Vaccination is going to take advantage of this specific immunity right here of actually using the B cells and the T cells to actually fight disease by actually introducing a form of the disease to the body so it can actually build its own immunity. When we look at types of immunity, there's cell-mediated immunity. This is going to be T cells. These actually go and are directly attacked attack an antigen. So they see an antigen, they've recognized it before, there's memory cells made to them, and they're actually going to put a cytokine on them that's either going to sit there and try to destroy that cell or it's going to tag it for a B lymphocyte to go pick up in a lymph node and actually make an antibody for. And that's cell-mediated immunity. These T cells wander throughout the body and they're actually looking for any type of antigen that they've noticed before or some of these are actually looking for new antigens uh, that they're going to actually sit there and make a cytokine to actually attach to and they're going to actually keep a memory for it and anytime they see that antigen they're going to react. Antibody mediated immunity or what's known as humoral immunity also is B lymphocytes. These actually live in the lymph nodes and they produce antibodies specific to an antigen. So when they see an antigen they're going to make an antibody and those antibodies are going to be released into the bloodstream and are going to circulate throughout the body and are actually going to attack that specific antigen anytime they see them. And so these different antibodies are things like IgG, IgM, IgE, IgD, I, uh, IgA. So all these different uh, IgEs that you've heard of, of immunoglobulins uh, are going to be produced by the B cells. And these B cells are very specific on what antigens they actually make antibodies against. And they also have memory. And so the thing about cells with memory, be it cellular with T cells or B cells, is that they're actually able to clone themselves. And so in the case of T cells, they're able to make more T cells to fight that specific antigen. In the case of B cells, they're able to clone themselves and make more B cells in order to make more antibodies to actually fight that antigen. When we look at specific immunity, there's going to be really two different forms. And one of these forms we're going to break down into two subforms of it. The first one we're going to look at is actually the one in the middle, is passive immunity. So this is actually like when a, a, a newborn actually gets the colostrum and the antibodies from its mother after birth. And so this is actually passed on from one animal to another. Another form of this is us actually giving plasma or an antiserum from one animal that's been exposed to an antigen to another animal that has not been exposed to it and to treat disease that way. And so that's passive immunity. So the body's immune system is not actively involved. It's relying on another animal's immune system to actually make the antibodies for it. Active immunity actually arises from the body whenever it encounters an antigen. And so in the case of this is when you're going to have something like a T cell actually see an antigen, mark it, or make a, an immunity to it and recognize it. And then you're going to actually have B cells also recognize it, and they're actually going to sit there and start making antibodies specifically against that antigen. And so this is active immunity. The body's immune system, those B and T cells, are actively involved. There's natural immunity, so this actually comes from things such as normal biological experiences, so like you getting a cold and actually making antibodies against the cold. 
uh, or getting uh, some other type of uh, infection and your body actually makes antibodies from that natural infection. The other form we have is artificial immunity and so artificial immunity is actually vaccination. It's actually us introducing the disease to the animal and that introduction of the disease through a controlled method actually creates uh, immunity for the animal through active immunity. So we're going to actually put a killed form of a virus or a modified form of a virus or a bacteria into the body and the body's active immunity, those B and T cells are actually going to start making antibodies against it and making T cells to actually go and fight it anytime that it it actually sees that antigen again. So when we look at vaccines, vaccines are made up of either weakened, live, killed, uh, microorganisms that have been prepared in such a way as to stimulate the body's immune system so the immune system can actually make those antibodies and those T cells to actually go and fight it. And so when we look at it, we have several different types of vaccines. And so the first one is inactivated or killed vaccines. And so these are actually microorganisms, viruses, or bacteria or parts of bacteria that have actually been killed and actually been treated to where they will not uh, harm the host uh, or the animal that we're putting the vaccine into. They actually have something called uh, adjuvants in them that actually keep them stable and keep them to where they're not going to degradate. And the thing that the adjuvants do is they they actually help to keep everything stabilized with that vaccine. A lot of times when we have vaccination reactions is actually to the adjuvants. The main thing about killed vaccines is these are very safe, they're very stable, and they're not going to actually cause a disease in the animals when we use a killed vaccine. The disadvantage is, is you don't get a strong of immune response from a killed vaccine, so it requires repeated doses. So we have to repeat the doses frequently uh, every year or every couple of years. And the other thing is, is every time that you introduce this vaccine again, there's always the chance of having possible reactions, including anaphylaxis. The next type is attenuated or modified life. So these microorganisms we actually have done something to. It's actually the disease itself. And so what we've actually done is we've actually modified that virus or that bacteria to where it's not as virulent. It's not going to actually cause the actual disease in the animal, but the animal is going to actually recognize the vaccine as actually like having the actual disease because this modified live virus is actually going to replicate within our patient the same way that it would if it was actually infected. The main thing is, is it's not going to actually get the full disease. It might have some symptoms of it, but it's not going to get nearly as sick as if it actually got that specific virus or bacteria. The advantages of this is a much longer immunity. It's a lot more effective immunity, and it's very quick on actually stimulating cellular immunity and humoral immunity both. And you get a lot more memory cells out of this, so there's a lot more memory to modified live viruses. The disadvantage is, first off, we can't give it in pregnant animals because it can possibly cause abortions. It can't produce mild forms of the disease, so you're going to have some transient illness that will come along with this. Potential for some times for some viruses to be shed into the environment. And it's very important to handle these things properly. So when we look at things like some modified live or attenuated vaccines or bacterial like Bordetella, when we handle them, we want to make sure that when we handle these things after we're done, first off, we give any killed vaccines or other vaccinations first before we use these. And then second, after we're done handling them, that we wash our hands properly so we don't accidentally uh, put this in another injection, say, if it's meant to go in the nose, accidentally underneath the skin or potentially expose another animal to this modified live virus and cause an illness because uh, maybe it has a weakened immune system. We go to give it a shot of penicillin for it, and now we accidentally introduce this vaccine and we weaken their immune system even more. So handling and storage is very critical with these. We actually use live uh, virus vaccines sometimes. The main one that we use is BRB51 for brucellosis. And what we're doing is we're taking a very small number of the microorganisms that actually cause the disease and we're injecting it into the animal. And the advantage of this is it requires one or maybe two doses at most. In the case of brucellosis, it's one. It has a very long lifetime of immunity. It's relatively inexpensive. We don't really have to worry about adjuvants as much. We still use them, but they're not as much. 
the main problem is is that uh, you know there is virulence, so you have to be very careful handling it. You give them too much, you can cause a full illness in the animal, so we have to be sure that we're giving them the proper dose. Also, it can cause virulence in us. If you accidentally inject yourself with brucellosis vaccine, you can actually get brucellosis. Uh, really new technology out there is the recombinant vaccines, and so these have become really popular. And well, basically what we're doing, and the, the one I can explain the most uh, the best is West Nile virus. We use the canary pox virus to use to make this recombinant vaccine for horses against West Nile. This is a live uh, virus vaccine and the way that this actually ends up working is that we take the canary pox virus that causes canary pox in canaries but will not do anything to a horse and we actually go back and genetically modify it to remove the outer coating of the actual virus off of there and put back on the virus for West Nile. So the inside of this genetically modified recombinant vaccine ends up being canary pox. So it's not going to cause any disease in the horse, but the outside of it looks exactly like West Nile. And when we introduce it in the body, it works exactly like that modified live we were talking about. It looks and acts and replicates just like the actual disease would without actually causing it because with the virulent strain on the inside ends up being a non-pathogenic organism. Very few side effects, very effective immunity, uh, variable ways that we can give it, uh, has very long immunity to it. Uh, it does cost more because we're using some very fancy technology to do it, but it's worth it for actually the effects that we get out of it. And there's a lot more recombinant vaccines coming onto the market. When we look at adjuvants, some things to know about is that they are used to enhance immune response and they're also used to stabilize whatever biologic agent that we have in there. And there's four different types. And so the first type is depot, the second is particulate, the third is immunostimulatory, and the fourth is mixed. And mixed is either a combination of depot and immunostimulatory or particulate and immunostimulatory. So depot adjuvants are very uh, are used a lot uh, and very important because uh, they can give a lot longer term immunity because when you put them in there, they actually keep the antigens from degrading in the, the patient very fast. So it gives the immune system a lot longer to actually go and look at that virus or that bacteria and actually come up uh, with the antibodies and everything that's needed. So it gives a much longer prolonged immune response. Uh, the downside is, is that, uh, you know, being in that depot in that medicine, you can have prolonged reactions to it. Or it's also possible that, uh, you know, you can end up having an overstimulation of the immune system because of how long it's there. Particulate adjuvants, these are actually the individual viruses. And the advantage is, is they're spread over a larger area, so you can actually get a very vigorous, immediate cellular and humoral immunity to it. The downside to particulate adjuvants is they actually break down the body a lot faster compared to the depot. So you don't have as long of immunity, but you actually get a much stronger initial immunity. Immunostimulatory uh, adjuvants, they actually promote cytokine production. So cytokine production uh, in these immunostimulatory adjuvants is very important to actually get the immune system kicked into gear. So cytokines are used whenever you first get a viral infection or a bacterial infection. And what it does is it signals the body's immune system to come to that one spot where that virus or bacteria is. And basically that's what these things do is they actually sit there with these immunostimulatory and they're actually going to call the body's whole immune system to the side of that vaccine. So it greatly promotes immunity through doing that. Mixed adjuvants, we're either mixing particulate and immunostimulatory or depot and immunostimulatory. You can't mix particulate and depot because they're kind of different. Depot's all in one spot, it stays in one location. Particulate disperses, so you can't mix those, but you can mix immunostimulatory with a particulate or an immunostimulatory with a depot. And that's what most of our adjuvants do today. In fact, uh, probably 90% of them that we have on the market are actually doing both particulate and immunostimulatory or depot and immunostimulatory. Some other things that we look at are some polynucleotide vaccines that are actually hitting the market. We do this with FIV vaccines in cats, where we're not actually putting the whole virus because the virus itself would actually end up causing disease or not have a really good immune response. And so we're worried about that uh, lack of either immune response or the potential of actually causing the full disease in the, 
in the patient. So what we do is we actually take specific antigens out of a DNA sequence and we inject those specific antigens say off of this outer coating of the virus. We'll actually take a segment of that outer coating of that virus and inject it into the animal and actually stimulate their immune system that way to actually recognize that outer coating as an antigen. And so we can select for specific areas of, of a virus uh, by using this or bacteria and not have to worry about actually causing the disease in the host. Toxoids, these are actually using parts of bacteria toxins or other toxins in the environment and we can actually give these to animals and stimulate their immune system. They actually, on here it has um, short duration of effectiveness and that's not true because tetanus is actually a toxoid and it has a very long duration and we know this in people if you have a first one in a booster we know it works 20 years and horses if you have a first one in a booster we know it works 10 years so shorter duration is not correct uh, but it does contain adjuvants and so that can cause reactions and it it is very good at producing uh, protection against things like clostridium tetani or clostridium types B, C, and D in sheep and goats. And so these are very important things that we can actually use, or black leg and cattle, uh, that we use these toxoids, and they actually seem to work for a very long time. Antitoxins, these are not really vaccines, these are serum products. And so we can actually use these in some forms of animals uh, if we're worried about them getting a toxin to try to ne neutralize it. So what we've done is we've taken serum from an animal that's been hyperimmune, given a lot of the actual antigen or the toxin. We take some of their serum off and then we actually go and give it to an animal that's been exposed to that toxin. And that's how antitoxins work. And it's just passive immunity. That's all it is. Uh, some of these things, like they'll talk about antitoxin use in horses. Personally, us in the equine business, we use toxoids because the antitoxin dose is not actually enough to actually pre prevent tetanus from occurring. So we don't use tetanus antitoxin. Uh, we prefer to use toxoids and then we actually use plasmas to actually try to treat tetanus or if we think there's a chance of tetanus we actually use plasmas because they're a lot more effective a hyperimmune plasma than the antitoxin vaccines are. Antiserums are a lot like the antitoxins right there except that we're looking at a specific antibody uh, and these are actually a lot of your plasmas and stuff you're looking at specific disease once again this is passive immunity this is not a true vaccine basically what we're doing is we're giving quick protection by using another animal's immune system and giving it to this animal that's been exposed to the disease or specifically has the disease. Autogenous vaccines, these are actually vaccines that are actually produced from the animal from a specific disease it has. Uh, and a good example of this is uh, pink eye in cattle. Um, the Moraxella vir uh, bacteria that a lot of these cattle get that causes pink eye. We have some strains that actually the pink eye vaccine does not work on. We will take the pink eye virus from those cattle affected in the herd. We will actually make an autogenous vaccine and we will actually inject it into the animal, into the muscle and get a much stronger uh, stimulation of the immune system to actually take care of that disease. Some different things that we're looking at is some uh, also we're actually looking at synthetic vaccines in the future. Some advantages of synthetic vaccines is the fact that we can sit there and be able to make a lot of our vaccines without having to do uh, use natural sources and so it would greatly reduce on reactions it would also mean that we could actually keep them stable potentially at things like room temperature types of vaccines we have multiple antigen vaccines known as polyvalent vaccines and then we also have monovalent vaccines which are only one single antigen in there so our most common single antigen monovalent vaccine is rabies we have a lot of different polyvalent vaccines. We have things like encephalitis, tetanus, West Nile vaccines for horses mix, distemper, parvo, corona, lepto, parainfluenza uh, vaccines for dogs, what they call a DA2 PLPC. And these are all polyvalent and there's multiple strains. And the thing is with the polyvalent is they actually have to prove that it has the same level of immunity when we mix everything together as if you were to give a single dose. The advantage of a polyvalent vaccine is uh, especially when you're looking at something like DA2 PLPC where you have distemper, parvo, um, adenovirus, parainfluenza, lepto, corona, all those different things mixed together. If you were to do that, you have six different things in one vaccine. That would be six different shots if it's monovalent, but with polyvalent agents, it turns it into where it's just one shot for those six different things. 
Maternally derived antibodies, these are going to come from the mother, and so one thing that's very important is to actually make sure the offspring has proper immunity. And so to do this before the mother actually gives birth, usually about a month before, we will actually booster her vaccines, and this actually raises her antibody levels to a satisfactory level to where we know there's going to be enough antibodies within the colostrum. Vaccination reactions, uh, these are actually happen, there's different vaccination reactions that can occur. Uh, these actually happen in response to the vaccine. Some of these are going to be perfectly normal. Others are going to become medical emergencies. Any type of vaccination reaction we have needs to be recorded in the medical record for anybody in the future vaccinating that animal knowing what's going to happen. So they have a whole list of them here, and we'll go over a couple of them that are kind of normal. Uh, after you vaccinate an animal, it's normal for them to have fever. It can be normal for them to have lethargy. It can be normal for them to have vomiting and salivation. Those are all things that are normal. Things that are not are local tissue reaction, like redness and swelling at the injection site, difficulty breathing, which would be a sign of anaphylaxis, a severe emergency, a medical emergency, um, vaccine-associated sarcomas in cats. And so a lot of times cats, we actually like to give the vaccines in their uh, hind leg, and we will give it only in one hind leg because some cats are genetically predisposed to this. If they get these vaccine-associated sarcomas, these can become very lethal to them very fast, what we actually do to actually save their life because these things are very aggressive is actually amputate that back leg. And so if we notice that we have one of these vaccine associated sarcomas in a cat, we amputate the back leg, we make a note in the record and we don't vaccinate them anymore because we don't want to lose the other back leg. Uh, and then we have things like uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemias, anemias in dogs, what's known as per per hemorrhagicum, and this is actually a response of the immune system to the vaccine. It's kind of like a delayed response. It's not anaphylaxis, but uh, it comes from, rises from that same family. It's just delayed, and you actually start having rupture of the red blood cells in response to the vaccine and the body's immune system kind of going crazy. And if we have something like this, once again, we're going to note it in the record, and we're not going to give them that vaccine again. So things like reaction sites, anaphylaxis, sarcoma, or autoimmune conditions from vaccinations. We're not going to vaccinate that animal again. When we start looking at uh, vaccines and we start looking at protocols, it's very important first off with all vaccines that we give proper care and handling, that we keep them at the temperatures, refrigerated at the temperatures that they say they need to be, that we handle them properly, uh, that we don't accidentally expose ourselves or other animals or other people to a vaccine that could be potentially harmful. The other thing is mixing them up. A lot of these have to be reconstituted. And understanding when we reconstitute a vaccine, we probably need to use it within an hour. We don't want to like make a whole week's worth of vaccine and draw it up and leave it in a refrigerator. When we do that, what actually happens is it's not going to become harmful to the horse uh, or the dog or the cat that actually gets the vaccine or whatever animal it is. But it's going the vaccine is going to lose its efficacy. So it's not going to actually be effective anymore for that animal because that virus is going to actually start to degradate. So whenever we handle a vaccine or if we pull a vaccine out, we want to use it after uh, with probably within 15 to 30 minutes of us drawing it up if it's going to be out at room temperature because as it starts to warm up, the virus is, or the bacteria is actually going to break down or the toxin in there and the animal's not going to get what it needs to actually be protected. We need to make sure we go the proper route. If it says to go IM, we make sure we go into the muscle. If it says sub-Q, it goes into subcutaneous tissue. If it goes internasally, we make sure it goes internasally. If we take it outside the proper route of administration, uh, we can either get, like if you accidentally give something that goes internasally, that's a bacteria like Bordetella, we give it in the muscle, we can cause an abscess. If we give something that's required to be IM and we accidentally give it sub-Q, then it's probably not going to come up to the amount to be effective. If it requires sub-Q and it goes in the muscle, maybe there's an adjuvant that's going to once again cause an abscess or a problem. Proper use, we don't mix vaccine products, and this is because different viruses react differently to different adjuvants. Same thing with different bacteria. And you mix two together. You mix something like a rabies and a distemper parvo together. Uh, the adjuvants in the distemper parvo might make it to where that rabies virus breaks down and it's no longer effective. So we don't actually mix the prop products. And we make sure that we use the label dose whenever we do this. When we start looking at patient issues, we want to look at things like age. So our most vulnerable patients and the ones that need vaccination the most are our pediatrics and geriatrics. 
They have the most compromised immune system and they require the most frequent vaccinations. You have to watch out for a lot of people will sit there and say, hey, you know, I've been giving this dog vaccines for 15 years now. He's 15 years old. His immune system should be strong enough. Well, actually, it's not because he's geriatric and this is a patient that really needs it now because his immune system with age is actually weakened. We want to make sure there's no diseases. So if we have an animal that has a respiratory disease, we try to vaccinate them at the same time. The issue is, is the body's already fighting one infection. We come over here and give them a vaccine. The body's going to ignore that vaccine and keep fighting the infection. So that vaccination is not going to actually be effective. Use of other medications when we do vaccinations, this really comes into using things that we'll learn about later on called corticosteroids, uh, things like dexamethasone or triamcinolone, Vetalog. If we give some of these with some of our vaccines, it can actually suppress the immune system and make it to where the vaccine is not going to be effective because the immune system, that cellular and humoral immunity is not going to kick in. Pregnancy, we have to be careful. Once again, remember our modified live and our live viruses can cause abortion in pregnant animals. So therefore, uh, knowing pregnancy is very important. There's some vaccines also that may be killed or recombinant that could potentially cause birth defects. So it's very important to know pregnancy status. Lastly, environment, where are we giving these at? So if we're giving a sub-Q vaccine and it's very cold outside, let's say like you're practicing in Minnesota, it's negative 10 degrees, you're outside vaccinating cattle with something that goes sub-Q, it's very cold, is that vaccine actually going to work? And the answer is no, because the skin is so cold, there's not going to be enough blood flow for the body to actually recognize that vaccine and that sub-Q space. And so you're not going to get proper immunity from that. Protocols, a lot of times practices give them annually. There's a debate about it on whether we should go to antibody titers. And there's a lot of people that advocate for this. The downside to it is, though, if you go off of titers and instead of following the label and that animal happens to get sick, the liability follows back to the veterinarian for not following that label. And so some veterinarians do advocate for doing titers, which can be costly to do. And they will do this, but they do take a risk. Uh, there's veterinarians, myself, I follow the label and I follow the label strictly from a liability standpoint. If I follow the label and I vaccinate that animal according to the label, then I know if that animal gets sick, I'm covered by the drug manufacturer. If I go off of the label and on my own, then I'm no longer covered. I'm on my own and it's on my own liability. We probably do actually over vaccinate our animals and this is kind of the way that the industry is made to where they want to make sure that people come back every year for vaccines. That being said, it's important to understand that when we look at an animal, if somebody calls you up and they say, oh, my God, you know, they were supposed to have their booster six months ago. I've got to get them in right away because they don't have any immunity left. Well, it doesn't really work that way. It's not like I gave a shot a year ago and if I don't give it today at midnight, that immunity is going to expire. It's actually going to last for a period of time probably for several years. So we can actually booster them and still get a very good effect later on and people don't have to get in a panic. They can wait a couple of days if they need to or the next pay period or whatever it is. And that vaccine is not going to run out on that specific anniversary date. It does not actually work that way. And there are a lot of practices and a lot of people that do make a very good valid point that we know that we do over vaccinate and what are some potential effects to our pets. We just have to keep in mind that when we deviate from that vaccination label uh, at all, that the liability falls back on us and no longer on the drug manufacturer. And then in your book, you're actually going to see specific examples of some different vaccination protocols. And so they go over some of the different ones for dogs. We kind of look at core vaccinations, the ones that are actually needed. Uh, versus um, vaccines that are non-core. So uh, a core vaccine is one that's going to be either pre preventing zoonosis, like rabies, or a, a very widespread disease, like parvo or tetanus. Non-core would be things that you would have to have exposure to other animals. So if you have a dog that stayed inside all the time, did not visit any other dogs, do you really need Bordetella? Well, if they're not visiting other dogs and they stay inside, uh, and they only go out on a leash and they don't touch nose with any other dogs, no, you can probably get by without Bordetella. However, on, at the same time, if you have an animal that's active, goes to dog parks, sees other people, other dogs all the time, or like for you, has an owner that works in the veterinary business, it's very important that they would actually get something like Bordetella. And even though it's a non-core vaccine, it's something that we give because there's that risk of infection. And so a core vaccine is something that they need to save their life 
or to stop zoonosis, non-core vaccine are usually things like respiratory diseases that they could get by without. They would get the disease. It would not necessarily be fatal, but it would make them very sick, and we're trying to prevent that sickness. And so a lot of times when we look at it, a lot of times these end up becoming our respiratory diseases that end up being non-core. Uh, but we can, you can go through and look at some of the different vaccines there and, uh, and actually do some research on it and find out for your area which vaccine would actually be a core vaccine and which one would not. The one I can tell you the best would be, first off, your dogs around here in Waco, uh, distemper, adenovirus, leptospirosis, uh, and parvo, or, and coronavirus, rabies. These are all things that we absolutely have to treat dogs around here for because we have them in such high amount. Things like parvo and distemper are so life-threatening. Leptospirosis, we have a lot of it in Central Texas. Uh, it and rabies, both are very zoonotic. Uh, things we could get by with out around here is we don't have Lyme disease that naturally occurs in this part of Texas, so we don't actually have to give that. But if you take an animal to where there is Lyme disease, you would want to make sure that they have that vaccine. Let's say like you go to... Uh, Northwest Arkansas on vacation. They have Lyme disease up there. You would want to make sure your dog's vaccinated for that. If they're going to be out where there's going to be uh, a lot of water that they can drink out of from creeks or stagnant water where Giardia lives, you would want to give them the Giardia vaccine. Uh, if they're going to be around a lot of other dogs, influenza or Bordetella would be ones that you would want to add to it. Uh, looking over here at horses, our core vaccines are going to be things like rabies, West Nile, tetanus, and the encephalitis, the eastern, western, and here in Texas specifically, Venezuelan. If you're in some other states, like uh, say you're in Tennessee or Kansas or Colorado, we might not do Venezuelan, but here in Texas we do. And so uh, all these, the encephalitis, the tetanus, West Nile, and rabies, these are all life-threatening diseases, and in case of rabies, a zoonotic disease that a horse can get and not have another horse within a thousand miles of it. And those are our core vaccines for this area. If you live up around the Potomac River area, you would also add Potomac horse fever to that because that's uh, in that area. It's not zoonotic, but it's life-threatening to the animals. And in the northeastern part of the United States, this is a very endemic disease in that area. Uh, things that, you know, would end up becoming... Uh, uh, Non-core, but ones that we will look at is our respiratory diseases, things like influenza, rhinopneumonitis, known as equine herpes virus 1 and 4, uh, and strangles. So these are diseases that horses would get from having contact with other horses. So if a horse stayed on a farm and did not see any other horses and did not have any other horses next door to it, we could get by with the core vaccines. But if it's going to travel or it has neighboring horses and those horses travel, you would want to make sure that you add it on in those respiratory diseases. Additionally, you know, if you have problems with things like uh, botulism in your area, you could add botulism to vaccine. There's an anthrax vaccine for horses if there's an anthrax outbreak in your area that you could add to it. And there's also things like rotavirus that we actually can give to mares. If we have a problem on a farm with rotavirus that causes diarrhea on brand newborn foals, we can actually give that to the mother to pass on the colostrum ahead of time. So that is vaccines.